As you know, we share a preaching calendar with uh, several churches here in the city when we all get together to prepare our sermons, to plan our sermons. We leave space throughout the year for us to deal with issues in our own individual churches as they are unique in our different places. And so we are gonna spend the next couple of months dealing with some things here in our church that will hopefully edify us and glorify God. And so one of the things that I want to do for the next few weeks is go back to the church in its early conception. So with that in mind, would you grab your Bibles and turn to the book of Acts? Acts chapter number one. Acts chapter number one will be in verses number one through 11. As we prepare to enter this short series, I want to start with saying something to you that I want you to remember every Sunday as you hear the word of the Lord preach from this series. And here's what I want you to remember is this. I love you. I love you. I love you. Acts chapter number one, beginning with verse number one, we'll grow th go through verse number 11. Let's stand in honor and reverence to God's holy word. Acts chapter one, beginning verse number one. Here is how it reads from the English Standard Version. You can follow along on the screen if you don't have your own copy of God's word. In the first book, O Theolophus, I have dealt with all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day when he was taken up after he had given commands through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. He presented himself alive to them after his suffering by many proofs, appearing to them during 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. And while staying with them, he ordered them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you heard from me, for John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And when he had said these things as they were looking on, he was lifted up and the cloud took him out of their sight. And while they were gazing into, the, uh, into heaven as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Beloved, I am concerned about the state of the church in America. I am concerned for several reasons. Biblical literacy is extremely low in the church. I am concerned because as I said earlier, we don't really know sound doctrine. One way that I know that we 
are unstable on sound doctrine is because we listen to guys like Stephen Furtick, Michael Todd, Joel Osteen, and Kenneth Copeland. I love you. But these are dangerous to the health of your soul. Thank you. I'm concerned about the state of the church as there is dwindling attendance across the churches in America. Financial giving continues to decrease. We now live in an age of production-centered churches. We now have churches that can rival Disney when it comes to being faithful to the word of God. I'm concerned for the state of the church because of how partisan we have become in the church. We have allowed politics to divide us. We don't love our neighbors as ourselves because of our politics anymore. I'm concerned for the state of the church because of actually how high pastoral resignations are in this moment. Some of those, the causes of those resignations have to do with politics and the pandemic. Many Christians acted a complete fool during the pandemic. And it took a toll on pastors. And many pastors have said, I can love Jesus and but do another job. Friends, Something is not right. As I've tried to figure out the cause of these myriad problems, I've concluded that the root of the problem is commitment. We're simply not as committed as followers of Jesus Christ, as we used to be or we should be. Can I just give you a little snippet of what Sunday used to look like where I grew up? And I'm not saying we necessarily got it right, but I just wanted to show you what the level of commitment the one demographic of the body of Christ used to look like. When I was growing up, you started out with Sunday school at 9 a.m. And then right after that, you had Sunday morning church at 11 o'clock. And, and the preacher had no concern for the nursery workers. <laughs> we stayed in church until a good, at least for the Baptist, we stayed in until 1 o'clock. If you were Pentecostal, you stayed in until 3 o'clock. I never knew how the Pentecostals did it. I would have to take a lunch break somewhere in there. But they did it. Now, where I was from, we, we'd get out at 1 o'clock, and we knew we were going to tarry for a few minutes, especially me because my mother was on the financial committee, and it took them a whole hour to count that $100. <laughs> I don't know what they did back there, but it took them an hour. When they finally came out at 2 o'clock, we knew we had to grab us some fried chicken real quick because there was likely an afternoon service with a sister church at 3.30. We went to church at 3.30 and had a whole service. Both choirs sang, there was a welcome and a response. Yeah, 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 we would say, y'all welcome to the church and we waited for somebody from the other church to stand up and, and give a response to the welcome. You had to say thank you. We did that. So we had us a whole service, and we finally get out around 6 o'clock. And then, 
they had the nerve to say, now we got BTU. Baptist Training Union. And had to go do that. And then finally they let us go home for the day. There was something about it. I'm not saying we got it right, but there was something about the Lord's day being the Lord's day. I'm not that old. I'm really not, Dominic. I'm not that old. But I remember a time where where the saints would cuss you out if you had a basketball game on a Sunday. If you did, they'd be like, my child won't be there. Because it's the Lord's day. Oh, let me see if I can make everybody mad now. There, there used to be a time where you didn't get no invitation to a birthday party on a Sunday. That was the Lord's day. I remember the first time I got an invitation uh, for, an invita- for a birthday party, and it said a Sunday. This, this was just what, 10, 15, because I'm not that old. This is about t- 15. Who, how old are you, girl? 14 years ago, 15, how many days? 15 years ago. And it says Sunday, and Connie and I look at each other, what's wrong with these people? <laughs> it was from church folks. They're like, don't they know we, this the Lord? That, there was something about that where, where Sunday, it was committed to the Lord. Yeah. Now, I don't want to be legalistic about it. If you want to throw your party, throw your party. Invite me, but I don't want to, I'm not going to show up. I'm an introvert. We want to be invited, but we don't want to be expected to show up. (laughs) But we now live in a time where everybody, let me just stick to the church, where where we want church and things related to church, let's get away from church. We, We want following Christ to be convenient and comfortable. And friends, I, I am concerned for us because the last time I, I read about the cost of following Jesus, he said, you got to be able to deny yourself. Take up a cross. I, I, as I think about the cross, I, I just can't, I, the cross, taking up a cross, carrying a cross never seemed convenient or comfortable. It was excruciating. And this is what Christ has said for his church. But now, but now, pastor, I will give you an hour and 15 minutes. And it's only an hour and 15 because it's the bridge. Everybody else get an hour. (laughs) It's not a play for you to give me longer time to preach. I'm going to say what I got to say. But there's something that's going on with us where we just want following Christ to be easy. But the last time I talked with the Lord, or the last time I read the Lord, because he told his disciples, in this world you will have trouble. Children of God, that ain't easy. We no longer want to sacrifice for Christ and his bride. And so now, what I want to call us to, as we lift him higher, that's what we shouted about earlier, we, call, we said we're going to lift him higher, and amen, we're going to do that. But I also want to call us to a higher level of commitment here at the Bridge Church. Friends, we need to get back to our biblical roots. We need to remember who we are as the church and what we do as the church. And those, those are my two goals in this series of sermon to remind us who we are and what we do as the church. And so today I want us to look at being committed to the mission. Committed to the mission. And that's where we find ourselves in Acts chapter number one. Luke has written his second volume to Theophilus. And now here in Acts, he says, I'm writing to you about what all Jesus, he started with what Jesus began to do uh, and to teach. And now he is going to write to Theophilus about the continuing ministry of Christ through his apostles and 
the church. The first thing we see when we look at Acts chapter 1 is the conviction of the church. The conviction of the church. Verse 3 says, he presented himself alive to them after suffering many proofs, appearing to them 40 days and speaking about the kingdom of God. On the Sunday morning following the death of Christ, uh, Christ appeared to his disciples to show them that he had risen from the dead. He wanted them to be to know and to be sure that he was not dead but was alive. And the text says that that uh, he proved that to them that he had risen by many proofs. That term for proofs means that which causes something to be known in a convincing and decisive manner. This, this, what were some of the proofs that Christ showed to his apostles to confirm that he had risen from the dead? One, he appeared to them. Two, he talked to them. Three, he showed them his nail-scarred hands and feet. He ate with them. He opened their minds to the scriptures. Christ left no doubt in their mind that he was, had risen from the dead and was alive. Friends, the resurrection of Christ is a settled fact. What, why does this matter at all? Beloved, without the resurrection, Christianity falls apart. Without the resurrection, there is no gospel. There is no good news. Without the resurrection, there's only bad news. Another good man died for a good cause. But the resurrection proves that he's not just some good man, but he's the God man. The resurrection proves that he is the savior of the world. And according to Paul, without the resurrection, our preaching is in vain. Without the resurrection, we are lying about God because the Bible says it was God who raised Jesus from the dead. Beloved, without the resurrection, our faith is in vain. Without the resurrection, we are still dead in our sins. Without the resurrection, there is no hope for life after death. Without the resurrection, those who have passed, uh, uh, on, passed on have not just fallen asleep, but they have perished. Without the resurrection, we as Christians are people to be most pitied. The resurrection is critical to who we are and what we do. It is a core conviction of Christianity. It gives meaning and purpose to us. But it's also critical because the resurrection is a critical core conviction of ours because that is exactly what we are to testify about. Look, look, there were a lot of people who witnessed the death of Christ, but only a handful of people witnessed the resurrection of Christ. This is why they as the apostles are commissioned to be witnesses because they know the whole story. And everyone who hears and believes their message will be saved and receive eternal life. That, that, that is the conviction of the church. And so based on that conviction, we now receive a commission for the church from the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at verse 6. He says, so when they had come together, they asked him, Lord... Will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? There's a problem with this question. Go back to verse 3. The text says that Christ spoke to them about the kingdom of God. But here in verse 6, they ask about the kingdom of Israel. God had a much bigger plan for Israel. Israel's job was to be a light to the nations. So that God's salvation would reach to the ends of the earth. 
Their job was to be a corporate national witness to the nations that Yahweh was the one true God and only he was worthy of worship. God elected Israel for mission. The kingdom of God would be populated by people from every tribe, every language, every tongue, and every nation. Christ's response to the apostles is, is, is that it's not for them to know the date that God has already fixed. Their focus was to be on mission for the kingdom of God. That's why in verse 8 he says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and to and, and all Judea and to the end of the earth. Their task was to testify. Their task was to be witnesses of Christ to all the earth. In order for them to be effective witnesses, they needed something outside of themselves. What they needed was Holy Ghost power. Uh, beloved, I think I need to put a pen right here in my manuscript to, to remind us is that what makes us effective witnesses for Christ is not our eloquence. It's not our knowledge of, of even all of Scripture. It's not how great we are in apologetics, which is defending the faith. That is not what makes us effective witnesses for Christ. The, 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 the work of saving sinners is the Lord's. You can't say nobody. Your job as a witness is to be faithful to what the Lord has called you to do. And the Lord uses our faithfulness to do the work. This is how Paul says it. He says that I'm not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God that leads to salvation. Let the gospel do what the gospel was meant to do. You just be faithful in telling the whole story. What we need is the spirit because all of us, all of us are dead in our sins without Jesus Christ. And so like what we, what, what, what we need is the Holy Spirit to come up on dead souls and breathe life, new life into them so that they will be made alive. That is the work of the Spirit. All right, I'm going to stop Dominic. Dominic, stop, stop saying amen because he's he going to preach about this. The Holy Spirit. I, I, I love the Spirit. Beloved, we, we, not even, but let me also speak not to just us as individuals, but let me speak to us as the church. It is the spirit that makes us effective. It's not our strategic plans. It's not our vision statements. It's not our ministry maps. It's not how attractive our Sunday morning gatherings are. It's not how seeker sensitive we are. It's not about how big of a production we put on on Sunday morning. The only thing that makes us effective and successful is the Holy Ghost. Amen. For us to be effective on this mission, we have to rely on the power of the Holy Spirit. And if we don't rely on the Spirit, we are relying on our flesh. And that is dumb. <laughs> Our flesh is corrupt, depraved, selfish, proud, and limited. My prayer for us as a church is that we will accomplish God's mission by making disciples, of making disciples by relying on the power of the Holy Spirit and not worldly craftsmanship. So Christ promised them that they receive power to accomplish the mission, but then he gives them a plan. Thank you, Jesus. I ain't got to come with this on my own. He says, you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and to the end of the earth. He says, I want you to be witnesses to people that look like you, talk like you, and think like you. But I also want you to be witnesses to people that you consider to be others different 
Samaria. People that don't think like you, talk like you, vote like you. Jesus died for them too. There's a big pastor out in Texas. I won't call him name because he's decent. He's just kind of silly sometimes. There's a, there's a pastor, and he said something. I was reading the tweet from him, and he said the demonic left, blah, 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 blah. And I said, Pastor, his name in his Twitter handle is Pastor So-and-so. I said, Pastor, don't you know that the same people that you are calling the demonic left are the same people that maybe Jesus died for? Yeah. The, demonic, the people you are calling the demonic left are the very ones that you're supposed to be witnessing the gospel to. Yeah. He has so othered them that he can only think of them as the demonic left. Yeah. And don't get me wrong, there are some demons on the left. But let me tell y'all something. Cut the string. They're on the right, too. <laughs> and they're in the middle, for the record. So he says, I, I want you to go and share the good news of the resurrection with people who have different worldviews with you. And it can be, it's okay for it to be different right now because I'm going to shape them and mold them so that they have a gospel view of the world and everything. Friends, the responsibility given to the church by Christ is to be witnesses, to give testimony to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ and the promise of eternal life to all who turn and trust in him for forgiveness of sins. This is our commission. This is our responsibility. And it is oftentimes uncomfortable. If you wait for it to be comfortable for you to talk about Jesus to people who don't know Jesus, you will never be an effective witness, a faithful witness. Friends, the gospel turns families against one another. The, the gospel may get you shunned from your family. The gospel may end some relationships. The gospel is foolishness to the world. So you can't wait for it to be a good time or the right time. People are dying every day. We, we, we say this all the time, and I wonder sometimes if Christians, we actually believe this. We'll tell each other, you know, tomorrow not promised. Remember that when you think about being on mission for the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, I'm not trying to guilt you, but if that's what happened, that's called conviction, actually. I'm trying to call us back to commitment to the mission of what Jesus left us here on earth to do. All right, let me see if I can give y'all some shout before we leave. We've talked about the conviction of the church, the commission of the church. Let's look at the confidence of the church. Christ gives them their commission, and then he ascends to heaven, where he now sits at the right hand of the Father. This also shows us the fact that he said this right before he left the earth shows us how important what he just said was. These were his final words before he left the earth. He says it, and he goes back to the Father. He ascends to the Father. Friends, what we see is Christ now, he, he has been vindica vindicated all the more. When he was on the earth, he suffered humiliation, but now he's experienced exaltation. He's now going to sit at the right hand of the Father, the place of honor and power. And from heaven... He will continue to rule as king. The, the book of Acts is actually about the continued rule and reign of Jesus Christ through his spirit-empowered church. And verse 10 says, after Jesus ascends to the Father, two men show up in white robes. They stood uh, behind them and they said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way 
as you saw him go into heaven. Beloved, a hallelujah goes right there. The angels announced that the same Christ that left on the cloud is coming back on a cloud. And he's coming back for a church without a spot or wrinkle. That, 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 that's good news. When the angel announces that Christ will return, he never tells them when Christ will return. Come on, man. I think he says that one, he don't know <laughs> when Christ will return. But I think it's hidden from us because we're not to know the time. Our job is to be faithful stewards of the time we have until either we go to Christ or Christ comes to us. Our job is to do the works of him that sent us while it is day because night coming when no man can work. Church, it is time to stop wasting time on things that don't ultimately matter. D.L. Moody, the great preacher, said, our greatest fear should not be failure, but it should be of succeeding at something that doesn't really matter. And I'm convinced that many church folk are succeeding at things that don't ultimately matter. Beloved, what really matters for us as the church is our commitment to the mission of the church. Christ gives his commission on the earth and then he leaves on a cloud and the angels declare he's going to come back on the cloud. We're now living between two times. We are now living between the time of his first coming and his second timing. We, 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 we are now living between the times of promise and fulfillment. The question you ought to be asking is, how then shall we live between the times? And Jesus has already tell us, told us, go and be my witnesses. That's how you feel the time. Between the two, these two periods of time, what we do in between them, between Christ's first coming and his second coming, is be witnesses. Our job is to go and tell the person of the person and work of Jesus Christ. Our job is to go and announce the good news. When the angels uh, spoke to these apostles who were looking in heaven, they said, uh, why do you stand looking in heaven? When they asked him that, that was actually a mild rebuke of the apostles. And essentially what they were saying is, this is not the time to be gazing into the sky. This is the time to be going on the earth. And that's my question for us as the worship team comes back. Are we gazing or going? Many of us, I, I'm convinced that there are some of us in the church, we gaze so much What's that old saying? We are so heavenly minded that we are no earthly good. Are we gazing or going? Beloved, are you living life on mission or just waiting idly until God puts you to sleep? It's being disciple, being a disciple that makes disciples that make disciples your life mission. So as you do your vision boards, mm -hmm. as you craft your mission statement for the year, I've just given it to you to do the Lord's work here on the earth. And in order to do the Lord's work, that's going to require some things. What do we do now that we've been told? We need to be committed to the mission. One, I want to encourage you to be prayerful about the mission. But I, I, I want to encourage you to intentionally put on your prayer list 
Lord, give me an opportunity to have a spiritual conversation with an unbeliever. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Here's Jesus' solution. So pray to the Lord of the harvest. And so my, 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 here's some application. Put on your prayer list, Lord, every day, give me an opportunity to tell someone of your good news. And Lord, when I get that opportunity, give me the boldness to just say the truth and leave the results up to you. That's one point of application, pray. Secondly, it's time to eliminate some things from our life. Some of us are ineffective witnesses just simply because we don't have time. And so what some of us need to do is to carve out some time to be with unbelievers, to be around unbelievers and stop being so busy so that we can actually go. Do you know I set up the bridge originally? I set up the bridge. I asked the core team when I was, I said, core team, I need you to give me two things. I want two time slots from your life. Give me Sunday morning and give me an hour and a half for bridge group. Anything else you do is voluntary. That's on you. But I need two time slots. And I specifically asked them from two time slots because I wanted to give them space in their life to be on mission to be intentionally on mission so they can go. Sometimes in church, we are our own worst enemies. We have people at church so much that they don't have time to be with unbelievers. Thirdly, some, for some of us, this is gonna be very inconvenient, uncomfortable, and some of us may think it's unchristian. But we need to pop these Christian bubbles that we live in. We Everything we do, we want it to be tied to Christian this, Christian that, and Christian that. And because of that, we don't get a chance to see. We don't, we don't go into Jerusalem, Judea, and, and Samaria, and other parts, uh, other parts of the earth. Because we in these Christian bubbles. So now... If we're going to be committed to the mission, that means we're going to have to pop these bubbles and go be with the heathens. We must be committed to what our Lord has called us. There, we, we, we can be successful at a lot of things at the bridge. But if we are not committed to being witnesses, we have failed. If we're not going to be committed to being witnesses, if we're not going to be committed to making disciples, let's close the doors now. But if we're going to be a church that's committed to Jesus Christ, then we must be committed to being witnesses. We must be committed to the mission. And commitment requires sacrifice. I'm sorry, worship team, I thought I was done. Y'all come on. If y'all stand behind me, it'll make me paranoid. Commitment requires sacrifice. And for us to be effective witnesses, it's going to require sacrifice from all of us. Can I prove to you that commitment requires sacrifice? God was so committed to you that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, to sacrifice his own life. Now that God has made that commitment to us, we owe that commitment to him. Jesus paid it all. All to him I now owe. Let's stand.